Zach, take it away. Okay, I'm going to demo um, component concurrency limits in the dependent values update job. We made a change that uh, allows us to control in, during, at runtime how many components will be executed at once in a single dependent values update job. Uh, and so let me demo that. So first, this is what it looks like normally, right? I, it's set to the default, which is 256. So you update the region, all the security groups start updating all at once and the region, because it has uh, a qualification that runs um, pretty snappy. So let's, uh, if we do it at two, it'll take a very long time for you to see it. So let's do 10. So there's a column for the for every workspace, you can update a column in the database that controls the concurrency limit. And we're gonna expose this on the admin panel so that we can we can use it to um, go to a workspace that's like really taking up a lot of resources and say, hey, you don't get to take up as much resources. So uh, maybe, maybe unless you pay us, but no, I don't know. Well, I don't know what the reason will be, but basically operational control. Okay, so we reduced it to 10. So now you'll see that we only light up 10 at a time because those are the ones that we're working on. Uh, they're staying lit up because they're not finished yet because they have other functions that need to run. But as, as components finish, they will start to finish. And so we just keep adding more uh, as they execute. And come on. Boy, it makes you want to set that number to infinity, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and maybe we'll find out whether this, you know, maybe infinity is the option that we need more controls uh, at the Veritech or Cyclone level. I don't know. But it's finishing. Oh, no, I'm pleased that we have this control. This will be useful. There we go. And these should all be US West C. They're getting US West 2. Okay. And finally, the end of my demo. And there we are. Okay. Well, that's component concurrency limits. And I'm going to try and find the Zoom window to stop the share. Fabulous. Thank you, Zach. All right, Fletcher, take it away. Okay, so you might you might guess that there's like a, a theme or a vein of stuff running here, um, which is us being able to understand our capacity and being able to um, not lose work and not overwhelm our system. So what I'm gonna show here is um, some updates we've made to a library we're using in our like uh, message consuming services. Um, one of those actually was probably the one that um, Zach was indirectly driving, ping our job server. Uh, so what I have on the left here is just an example program that's in our in our code that sets up um, one of these small applications. Um, I'm importantly gonna um, limit it to like only have, uh, only process kind of four messages. Um, so only like four tasks in flight at any one time through this kind of service. And I'm doing that because I'm gonna show what it looks like on shutdown. And um, on shutdown, what we're going to do is trigger some graceful shutdown logic. Um, this one is just sort of the shutdown logic around this Naxum app itself, or the library itself. And what we're doing in our, like, what the service is doing is not very much. Um, pulling in the message, just going to figure out what the payload is. All I'm doing is um, I just populated uh, in my Nats instance here. I just made a jet stream one. I published 500 messages. They just have like the count of the message. So it's just like a string that's a number. So nothing fancy to deserialize. And then, um, then I'm just simulating that this is gonna take seven seconds of work. So like a, a longer running task and then every half second or so, I'm just gonna say, I'm working on it, I'm working on it till it's done. Um, so if we watch it go, You'll see the the the, the blues uh, are kind of the the work that's happening in flight, um, and then the, that's just the count number. So you can see that green coming by meant that like that first four basically finished. They're taking all about seven seconds, so they'll kind of go in a wave here. Um, but importantly, what I want to do is um, 
when I hit control C, so when I signaled the graceful shutdown, what I kind of want to see are like these messages, um, like maybe when the next batch go by, I'll hit it. Um, what I want to see here is uh, this next batch, like the 2019, 17, 18, like I don't want to see 22, 25, 30 for it to like continue going on to infinity. So if I find here where I, this is where I hit control C, and we already had some sort of work that started. So there's already stuff that spawned off. So what we're doing now is importantly, we're not immediately exiting and canceling that work in flight. So we're gonna let it run to completion. Right now, the Naxum framework itself, if it took six hours, it's gonna take six hours. We have other mechanisms to like uh, have a timeout that's just only gonna be so patient on that, but the Naxum app doesn't really necessarily need it. And that kind of matches what the Axum HTTP server does. If it took six hours, Axum is going to take six hours. Um, so I guess the important part is you kind of see that work happens. Um, then we sort of finish up our work and then the graceful shutdown knows that like, okay, now all of the outstanding tasks, which were four, they've finished, they've come in, we can finish our shutdown. So if this was kind of our whole service, um, that's kind of what the graceful shutdown looks like. Now, if I was to uh, take this, concurrency limit off. Um, and this is just a slightly different way to drive this service. And if I build it again, um, what we're going to get are the defaults of, of NATS coming at us. And what we're going to get here um, coming from NATS, when, we, when I set this up, this consumer, it, by default, it's a pull-based consumer. And the default batch size it's going to go and get, if they're available, is like 200 messages. So. If I was to start to run this and hit control C pretty quick here, um, oop, what you're going to see is this number actually gets pretty close up. So I did hit control C. You can see there's still work in flight happening, but we get, we get almost the 500 messages off. Now, why is that? That's basically the batch size. I think it's 200, but it could have been 400. <laughs> um, it's a very high number, but you can see that like without us necessarily um, having the ability to constrain work at, at the consumption side, it's possible our services could get like a little bit overwhelmed. If you could think about each of these as a very expensive operation, maybe we want to deal with this amount concurrently. Maybe we don't. Maybe that limit number is a, an extremely high number and maybe it depends on our service. But basically we, we have the ability to control that at the consumption side, no matter what sort of volume of work is waiting for us on queue. And then also importantly, making sure that work is allowed its, its opportunity to like complete its work um, so that um, uh, I guess the other thing that happens is once that signal, graceful signal shutdown happens, we're sort of immediately um, unsubscribing from the queue. So there's no more other work. Any, anything that was in the batch that we haven't acknowledged just sort of gets remains on the queue. So what we've got is the equivalent of we stop subscribing and we drain all of our work and then we quit. So it's, um, I think what we would expect we want in our services, it's not exactly what we've had till let's say last week. Um, and we'll sort of see the, the effect of that, um, how that plays out. But what, what I expect we should see is um, less to no sort of work and flight loss that uh, can't go back to like these sort of incoming queues and most of our services operate that way. So nice. And I suspect this won't be the last um, demo that's around, you know, shut down and not losing work. Yeah. Because as we as we get closer and closer, part of the big focus is on those operational pieces that are like, how do we make sure that we don't lose people's data? How do we make sure that your work in flight always gets accomplished if it can? Like, how do we deal with back pressure and noisy neighbors and all of those sorts of things? Like, you can you can smell the trend. Uh, Nick, you're up. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. I think this will work. All right, so today I'm going to be showing you more shutdown stuff. Um, say hi to Todd. Um, okay, so what we're basically doing is uh, I'm I'm actually going to piggyback off of what Fletcher just said, and we added sort of layered shutdown. So before we had um, we had shutdown that uh, that sort of drained everything immediately without any specific given order, and a hypothesis was with layer DB that layer DB wouldn't clean up after itself. It wouldn't close down its task. And, and as we were looking, we realized that layer DB threaded through all of its trackers and tokens well. Layer DB was actually closing too, too quickly. 
an SDF for Pinga had oncoming work. So this led to a bit of a uh, weird situation. So now what we do is we create multiple trackers and tokens so that you can have a unified flat list order for how to handle them and shut down. So for instance, we'll have your main sort of tracker shut down, in this case for Pinga, all the jobs, let's flush them out and close and not accept anything else. Then layer DB will wait until it's done because now it'll have all the jobs in flight. And then after that, we'll do telemetry. And we want telemetry to always be the last for reasons that are fairly self-explanatory. And you can see here, it's very similar to before. You borrow trackers, tokens are easily clonable, and you thread everything through until the end. Well, what Fletcher was mentioning is now we have sort of in our graceful shutdown handler, you pass them in in groups and the groups are ordered based on how they're sent to the graceful shutdown handler. So if you look, um, this is some of the SI service graceful shutdown code and our four main Rust services use it. Uh, I think I think SDF were it's still in like a partial holding pattern. I got you that can in see, flight right now. <laughs> yep. And you can see here the groups, uh, you can either pass in an iterator. So Fletcher and I actually borrowed each other's works here, it seems, because Fletcher uh, extended this even further, which is pretty awesome. Um, but you can add each group in a specific order. In the future, you may want a dependency graph. Like, let's say you don't care that, like, two things wrap up at the same time. In the future, we may want it so that you can do, like, a map. And these things depend on this things. And you drain in a certain order. But the way this draining sort of going to work, and there's this telemetry guard to make sure that, yes, you pass it in as an explicit group. But we do some, like, extra double checks to make sure uh, telemetry shuts down well. And this wait loop sort of occurs that Fletcher was exactly showing. But what I'll but what I'll more zoom in on is this sort of like this async drain type thing with the saturating ad. This is exactly how it'll basically perform the shutdown procedure to drain in a set of groups to make sure that our services close one after the other. What's out what's excellent about this sort of ordered drain process is that. Um, let's say you're authoring a new service and system initiative, or you're debugging one in production, or you're working with an existing service or even deleting one. This should all be pretty easily trackable through tracing. And it's a pretty declarative order with specific tokens that we could follow down the whole stack. Uh, and that concludes my demo. Sorry. I'm like, I, I rewired my desk. So I got to find out where the zoom thing is. Cool demo, though. Yeah, it was such an abrupt ending to the demo, I think. Uh, no. It's like a fun day of people not okay. being able to stop Zoom. There we like, go. Okay. Uh, John Watson. It is time once again for the John Watson experience. <laughs> stop. Um, yeah, it's funny. If I accidentally share the wrong window, you'll see me telling John Kaiser I really like his shirt. So hopefully this works. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. So... You should be able to see part of my window. Yeah. Yes. So I've been also running some operational stuff and it was basically it, some of the first stuff I ran was uh, handling maintenance mode in SDF. So the idea was that uh, before Fletcher and Nick's work landed, uh, we weren't confident we'd finished all the work in the back end before we actually terminated the services on upgrade, et cetera. So I implemented this uh, signal handler so that we basically can send a signal to SDF to put it in maintenance mode. So let me show you that now. So this is my local workspace and I could send this USR2 signal that I've repurposed into SDF and then basically the next API call, it will be like, oh, hey, dude, we're down. Uh, so this could be pretty helpful if we've got like a, a naughty node somewhere in our fleet. Um, or if we, something's wrong basically and want to, uh, pull the system offline for a period of time so I can pull it back and basically there's no refresh needed. It just kind of works again. And this will just go away after 60 seconds or you can click dismiss. Um, so yeah, that's the first thing I did. Um, and that's then so cool. Yeah, that it's live on the same. Yeah, I really like it. So it would be cool if we could do this to any backend service as well. So you can basically pull, you know, if something is uh, thrashing, you can pull it out of the fleet. It would use Fletcher and Nick's like uh, nicely, play nicely behavior. And then new nodes would come up and take the work off it, basically. John, you're reading my mind here. I was about to message you afterwards. Should we do this on yeah. other services? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should just do it on all of them. Funny. 
is that I worked on this with John. It's not by accident you're seeing everybody co-authored on each other's commits for this stuff. <laughs> we may live like 10,000 miles away, but we do collaborate. Right. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, that that that's for SDF. And basically the idea behind putting on SDF first was like, that's the ingestion point for work. We've got no cron triggers or anything. So if we stop the work coming in, we can handle the backend work eventually. Okay. The, I implemented uh, um, like a toolbox item to help us trigger maintenance mode in uh, in our production services and tooling services. So you don't need to like go into the machine yourself, figure out what to run. You can basically just trigger maintenance mode directly using the toolbox. And this is the same method we've implemented in CI on upgrades. So we're using the toolbox to like, you know, we're dog fooding basically. So we're implementing the maintenance mode using the toolbox and then we upgrade and then we, uh, yeah, run the rest of the upgrades basically. Okay. Uh, the second thing I changed was basically this toast. So we were seeing things like, uh, what if we're upgrading the client hasn't connected to the back, like the load balancer hasn't connected to the SDF backend properly and there's nothing serving the request, the web client for the existing session. Um, or let's say an API call at the load balance layer times out. Hopefully my screen just disconnected. I don't know what that was. Right. The API call that uh, load balance layer times out or CloudFront times out and we were unable to serve the request basically. And Adam, I think you saw this uh, mm -hmm. maybe yesterday, was it? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. So this is like, yeah, 504 or 502. Um, and I can't really simulate this without just destroying the SDF code. So you just got to trust me. Basically, if we get a backend error, you'll see it like this. Uh, like if there's nothing serving the request, the web client. Okay. Uh, the next thing I added was some like outage handling stuff into the web UI. So basically now we, the uh, web UI like always, well, it dynamically queries our status page and figures out if we're within an incident or if we're within maintenance. And if we are, you'll see one of these, um, one of these little icons at the bottom. So you're like, Ooh, they're in maintenance. I know that my things shouldn't be landing or they're offline. Let me reach out to someone in discord for help or reach a support query or whatever, so that you don't need to if you're experiencing weirdness, you don't need to go looking for it. You'll see it in the UI, which is kind of cool. Super cool. Um, and yeah, I had to test this. So this is our status page and I triggered some example. Paul, you'll love the uh, uptime damage I did doing these example tests, but basically I did two incidents and it worked. That's how I got the uh, pings in there. The so final... Sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The final thing I want to show is just on Fridays, we do authoring Friday and I just wanted to show where we got to. So basically we do this publicly in discord. People can join, ask questions, uh, get involved. And we are starting to, uh, build out like the GCP coverage. So we built, uh, this one and I think subnet last week, maybe not. Okay. We are getting through subnet. But yeah, so you're welcome to join and thank you for everyone who attended. It was super fun. Sweet. That's me. All right, that's us. Uh, can I do a really quick walk-on actually? Oh, hell yeah, you can. Right. Walk-ons were the best. Uh, this this is just a couple of small things that I kind of forgot about. Um, we had a very small incident uh, last week and it took longer to resolve than it should have because I was logged in to the wrong environment and restarting SDF in one environment and checking results in a different one. Um, so I added a really obvious indicator when you log into these boxes, which environment you're in and which box you're logged into. So no more mistakes. I'm talking to production Pinga here. So I wanted to show that because I think it's kind of neat and it should prevent us from having issues and like that in the future. Um, and kind of going off of uh, what John just showed, we refactored the deployment pipeline um, to account for uh, more parallelization and um, doing database and other migrations like out of band. Um, it's still pretty fast and goes, but 
it uses the nifty maintenance mode thing that John showed. So if you see that little maintenance mode guy pop up, it could be just that a deployment's happening and it'll be back in a minute. But I just wanted to show that we spent a bunch of time, thought about this, redesigned it, and then there it is. That's it. Love it. Fabulous. Yeah. All right, future people. We will uh we'll see you next week. <laughs>